Welcome to Constant Wonder. I'm Tenery Taylor. On this show, we like to bring you stories about wonders of the natural world and of people who are themselves natural wonders. That's the kind of story we have for you today. A story that will make you rethink what's really possible in a human life. We're sitting down with Kevin Kling, a professional storyteller and playwright beloved for his heartwarming and hilarious tales. He joined me live in our studios, and he started off by telling me a story where wonder went off the rails. And that's not where we usually go on this show, but hang with me. Yes, wonder is going to go off the rails in this episode, but we're also going to witness some surprising, heartbreaking moments of grace. Let's meet Kevin as a boy. He had something of what we call today a free-range childhood. In preparing for my interview with him, I'd read that he'd accomplished an unusual feat in a taxidermy class that his mother signed him up for by stretching out a chipmunk to nearly a foot long. And I asked him why his mother had signed him up for that class in the first place. My brother and I, there were these games. I remember we played this game. We would shoot an arrow up in the air in the yard. And I remember one time... My brother shot the arrow up in the air, and I took off running, and the arrow landed in a wood pile, and my brother came out, and he said, oh, it's a chipmunk, and he said, well, I wasn't even trying, and so animals kept coming home, and— Wait a minute, so the arrow killed the the chipmunk chipmunk, in the wood pile. In the wood pile, (laughs) but things around my brother, animals, they just met their end. He was just—and so my mom finally said, boys, I'm going to give you an appreciation for these animals. So she enrolled us in a taxidermy course, which was taught by the high school biology teacher, Mr. Damjanovich. And Mr. Damjanovich didn't teach like through the technical methods. He taught through his method called love. And he would put the animal on the table and he'd pet it and say where it came from. He'd give us a running history of the animal. And then he'd make a slight incision and he'd pull out the body. He'd see, boys, it's just like taking a little man out of his suit. And then he'd throw the body and then he'd put borax liberally with the borax, boys. And then he'd put a body inside, put on the eyes and to sew it up, and oh, man, it was incredible. We would just be <laughs> blown away. But we would dive into these chipmunks and these animals that we brought, and, well, they just didn't quite turn out the way that Mr. Damjanovich has had. But after a while, we got good, and my brother got really good. And as we'd say, my brother used to start doing things with animals they wouldn't have done in the wild given the proper training. Wait, wait, help me picture what your brother did that they would have done in the wild. <laughs> well, at this point, I usually do a couple ballet poses where, <laughs> where I go into different ballet poses of what the animal would be doing. So my brother, we uh, were in a Boy Scout troop, and every year— we would do the same thing. We would go to this place called the Brookdale Shopping Center, and then they had a winter show, and all the troops in the Twin Cities would compete to win the best blue ribbon for the best display, and we always won with winter camping, we called it. We even had this sitting in a guy's garage all summer long. It was just fake snow and a light bulb that spun around and a bunch of logs so it looked like a fire. It was terrible. It was like shameful. So the, the Brookdale show was coming up, and my brother stepped up in front of our troop, and he goes, well, men— we could do winter camping like we do every year, or we could do taxidermy. And you could just see the little eyes lighting up, taxidermy, 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 taxidermy. And another father stepped in front of my brother and says, he says, no, I think we should do winter too late, taxidermy, taxidermy. I mean, the fervor was on. And the whole next week you could hear, because we lived in the country. And if they saw something on the side You're of the road. You're talking BB guns. Yeah, you know, <laughs> and, or swerve, Dad, there's a project. And so kids brought all these projects and all these different projects. And we taught them the damn Yanovich method of love. But their first projects turned out kind of like our first project. They were terrible, and we only had two weeks to go. So uh, if, if a squirrel didn't, if it didn't turn out so well on one side, we'd have it leaning against the log, like, so you couldn't see what went wrong. <laughs> or if it was a really bad job, the tail would come from behind the log, like he's back there somewhere. But meanwhile, people were coming. This kid named John Stoner would come in with these amazing, beautiful, beautiful job. He was really gifted at taxidermy. And I remember one time he came in, and there was this, sheet over this project and he unveiled it and there were four squirrels playing poker and the one with four aces had had his (laughs) eyes back like whoa I'm gonna win for sure and we thought we are gonna win for sure 
Oh, and my brother made what we called the quilted squirrel. It was a squirrel where he, one had met his in bad on one side and one had met his in bad on the other. And he sewed these two squirrels together and made the quilted squirrel we thought was just brilliant. And so we thought, we're going to win for sure. So we set up in the Brookdale show and uh, people were coming by and we're like, look at this, look at this, look at this. And people were going, look at that. Look, you, you children should be ashamed of yourselves. So the next year we did winter camping and won a blue ribbon. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of those stories where in terms of, of wonder, it's when you're a kid, the possibilities are limitless. And it's where we get in some trouble. I think that's where a, a lot of times our wonder needs to be reined in because we will go places. I, I don't tell that story anymore because my views on the whole subject have changed. Tell me about that. Well, the way I feel about animals and the way I feel about sentient beings has changed over the years. And there's so many things about when I'm in my childhood that I look back on. And, and that story is a prime example of where wonder will go off the rails, where the sense of fantasy takes you beyond. And as a kid, you will just keep going with that. When he told me that he doesn't tell that story anymore, I asked Kevin if he wanted me to cut it. And he said no. And I've kept it because, as you'll hear later, it helps illustrate how and why his show has changed, why he's in a different place now as a storyteller than when he started out. But don't worry, despite even life-threatening challenges, Kevin Kling never loses his sense of humor. Now, let's get back to Kevin's childhood. I want you to know that Kevin Kling has what you'd call an indomitable spirit— I doubt you could tell from that first story that he was born with a birth defect. His left arm is much shorter than his right, and it has no wrist or thumb. So he's always worn a hard brace to support that hand. But as you can probably guess from that taxidermy story, Kevin wasn't slowed down by that brace. No, he, in fact, even employed it in some of his mischief-making. Here he is in our performance studio where he taped some stories for the Appleseed podcast here on BYU Radio. When we were kids, we were learning to ski, right? And to get to the top of the hill, we would take what's called the rope toe. Do you have rope toes here? You know, okay, so you know what these are. So you grab onto the rope and it pulls you to the top of the hill and then you slide back down. Well, at the bottom of the hill was a huge sign that said, absolutely no long hats, long scarves, or woolly mittens allowed on the rope toe. And my brother and I are standing there in our long hats, long scars, woolly mittens. <laughs> they don't mean us. And I grabbed onto the rope, and when I got to the top, I found out why that sign was there, because the rope twists as it goes up the hill. And if you're wearing woolly mittens, they twist into the rope. They actually become part of the rope toe. So I get to the top of the hill, and I go to let go, but I can't, because my mittens have woven into the rope. I pull my right arm free, but my left arm was not coming free, and it's starting to lift me up off the ground. I think, man, I've got to do something here. So I just let go of my brace, and my brace flies off my arm, and it's flying through the air. Well, the woman behind me sees it and says, oh, my, it's his arm. And (laughs) she's down, and people are piling into her. (laughs) <laughs> so we did the rope toe trick the rest of the day. That's <laughs> and that's kind of how Kevin viewed his disability growing up, as a resource. Here's what he said when I asked him about how his disability impacted his childhood. Well, it's hard to tell how it impacted my childhood because when you're born with a disability, you just grow from it. It's who you are. So I couldn't tell you that. Well, I know... I am a storyteller because of my left arm, because of the rhetoric people used around me. It was different than other kids. So I was immediately given a perspective as a child. Part of being a storyteller is what is your perspective? They'd call my arm withered or crippled or said, you poor thing. But I learned after time, by the words they chose, I could tell uh, whether they blamed me or my parents or God or themselves for my condition. And then with that information, I could get what I needed out of them. Rhetoric became really important to me as a tool, and I know that's because of my left arm. I'm so grateful for it, and I'm, I'm not even blowing smoke. It's really true. I, uh, I do feel really lucky that I was given this perspective. It's, it's opened so many doors for me. People talk to you when they make assumptions about you. So they see me with a disability, and they make assumptions, and a lot of those assumptions are opening doors. 
Can you give me an example? Yeah, and I think it was even here in Utah. Sometimes we go out and we'll talk in the community or in high schools. I've had some extremely great times in the high schools here in this area. One was in a a lockdown facility for juvenile offenders, and I went in and I was just scared to death. I was thinking, what am I going to do? How am I going to relate? And so I went into the facility. I think I had probably a five-minute window. If I got through that, they were going to be with me. They were so respectful. And so, and I think it is because of my disability that we had a connection and that they knew that I'd gone through some stuff and they clearly had gone through some stuff. They gave me a wonderful amount of respect just because they could tell I'd been through something and maybe I had something I could offer, you know, about how do you survive something? How do you survive things that, you know, in life that don't seem fair? How do you survive a world that's not built for you? By the end of the episode, I think you'll agree with me that Kevin Kling would be welcome wherever he went, both for that kind of empathy he has for people's problems, but also because he finds humor absolutely everywhere. And he has a story for everything. That storytelling ability was really honed when he was in college. Now, from what I've read, you were quite popular in college. Oh, I'm just curious. I didn't know that. (laughs) I've heard it. wherever you were, there was a story going on and a crowd was gathering. Uh, Is that true? Well, yeah. I don't know if it was because of the story or wondering if I was going to need stitches again. I got a lot of training from my buddies on just what makes a good story and how tragedy and humor are right next to each other. Because it's always something always wrong would happen, but then there was always a moment of hilarity in it. Kevin's crowd-pleasing storytelling ability may have been helped by the fact that he had some experiences that most college students couldn't top. My dad always had these experimental aircrafts. And so I remember I'd be in college, and uh, I would hear him buzz the campus. He would fly really low over the campus with the prop back flaps up, so it would make all this hideous noise. And I'd be in, like, psychology class, and I'd hear him, my dad's here, my dad's here. And I'd run to the airport, which was a mile from campus, and my dad would be waiting with the props still going around. And I'd get up in the plane and pull the cowling over, and then Dad and I would fly down the Minnesota River Valley. I know, so beautiful. During the fall, with the leaves changing, and we hit this fog bank, and we couldn't see anything. And my dad's this type A person. I look over, and he, like usual, he's shelling peanuts, drinking hot coffee, unfolding a map, and tapping an instrument. And uh, he turns to me, and he goes, Hey, Kev, do me a favor and look out that window and see if you can spot the ground. So I'm looking out the window, and I hear my dad go, Hey, Kev, it might not be down. (laughs) Kevin Kling's ability to laugh at danger, at disaster, that ability would be tested when he was in his 40s, already by this point a well-known storyteller and a playwright. That's when tragedy struck in the form of a motorcycle accident. In just a moment, Kevin will share with us the details about the accident that changed almost everything about his life, except his sense of humor. And those two worlds, not only tragedy and humor, but loss and humor. And that that kind of thing really helped me, not just telling stories, but in life, when the absurdity of a situation, especially healing, uh, especially trauma— especially going through, there will be a moment of absurdity that will be gut-bustingly funny in the middle of the darkest places. And you can even tell the story that way, and there can be a window in the violence, and it's just this refreshing air will blow through. We're talking to professional storyteller Kevin Kling, who is with us live in our studios here at BYU Broadcasting. I'm Tenery Taylor, and this is Constant Wonder. When he was born, Kevin Kling's left arm was shorter than his right, and it had no wrist or thumb. He's worn a hard brace on that hand ever since he was a child. But that never stopped him from doing anything other people did, and even more. 
including riding a motorcycle. And one day he was involved in a near fatal crash on one of his favorite motorcycles. I rebuilt motorcycles, antique motorcycles, and I'd rebuilt this. Uh, if you know motorcycles, it was a 1963 BMW R69S. And if you know motorcycles, you're going, ooh. And then you're going, you crashed that? It's the Cadillac of motorcycles. It, and it's this old, uh, oh, man, they're just the most beautiful bike. He was riding that motorcycle on August 11, 2001, when he entered an intersection and a car not seeing him turned into his path. He flew into the car and the accident nearly killed him. Here's how he explained the aftermath to me. So I was in the accident, and I suffered brain injury. A nurse told me, though, in the hospital, he said, you probably won't have much brain injury because your head used your face as an airbag. <laughs> so it did. <laughs> I don't think I should laugh at that. <laughs> no, I think it's, I, I did at the time, but it's true. So I had to have all kinds of reconstructive facial surgery, which, man, I just feel so lucky about those doctors I had that they just couldn't have been better. But I did lose the use of my right arm. I went through years and years of surgeries, of moving different nerves to try to get my arm back, but it never, that never happened. So it's, it, it was a very different world. And because my left arm, I have four fingers on that side, and it's much shorter, uh, my left arm had to start doing everything. And I tell people, I, I started calling my left arm Scarlet, as in Scarlet O'Hara, because it was, before the accident, it was like, bring me a Coke with some chipped ice, and now, now it's got to do everything. <laughs> So, yeah, life really, really, really changed. And my life didn't change for the better, but I feel I changed for the better. Is it impertinent for me to ask why somebody who only had one fully functioning arm would ride motorcycles? Is that rude of me to ask? No, it's not rude, but I don't get it. <laughs> It's, I just. I don't ride motorcycles. Well, don't you need two hands? No, no, you don't. I mean, you can, and I had interlocking brakes on my bike. On not that bike though, but I had where I could pull both the clutch and the brake on the same side, and I also had a foot brake. So I did work it out to where I could do it. I didn't even have time to touch the brakes when this car pulled in front of me, foot or handbrake. It was just like it turned, and I was into the side. He never even saw me. Kevin sustained a brain injury, and some nerves in that healthy right arm were severely damaged. And then he had what most people would call a near-death experience. I had what people, they say they see a light. I never saw a light. But I was headed for this incredible sense of peace, and I was actually given a choice to return to this plane of existence or to follow that peace. And was that like, do you remember hearing a voice? I mean... It wasn't a voice, but it was a clear choice. It was just a sense. Yep. Okay. I knew I could, I knew I could follow that piece, which is wonderful. It has really taken the fear of death away. I fear the threshold, but I don't fear the other side. And I've talked to so many people that have had a very similar experience of that sense of peace that awaits us on the other side. There's a woman I work with, too, though, that said she, and she's had a few near-death experiences, she was at the pearly gates and uh, she looked across and there was a no smoking sign and she went, nope, can't do it. And she came back, she, she <laughs> thanks smoking for saving her life. But that's another, that's, the, that's a rare one. Uh, <laughs> most of us are the same and it, it is profound. And other people I've talked to have that, a very, very, it's a very similar, well, well-trodden path. And so... Do you ever think to yourself, why did I decide to come back? Yeah. Why did I think it was worth it? I do. I, I thought about that a lot, and now I don't because I know why I came back. My whole work, everything I do changed with that. I really, I love telling stories, and I always was a storyteller. I think before the accident, it was pretty heavy on entertainment and laughter and enjoyment, which it still is. I think that's an imperative in stories is they have to be compelling. And humor, I just can't live without humor. But now I know why I'm a storyteller. It has given me a clear, clear, clear path in life. And not just for disability, which I do work in that community and advocacy a lot, but in terms of trauma and loss and just how important our stories are. I mean, 
post-traumatic stress has been described to me as living the same day over and over. It's when you can't get past that day the trauma occurred and it's in your body. And it's, and part of storytelling that people don't get is it's very visceral. It's body, it's chemical, it's everything is that your body remembers everything that happens to it. Every scar is a monument. Okay, here's one. So it's after the accident. I clearly have post-traumatic stress. And I'm having a really rough episode of it where I, I have my anger issues. I, have, I can't sleep at night. So I'm seeing this therapist. And she says, I want to try this therapy with you. We did a few exercises where we just talked about things. And then she had me walk through the accident and this time miss the car and keep going. And I slept better that night. My anger issues dissipated. And somewhere deep in me, the story had been rewired. And so that I missed the car. Well, I wake up, I still can't use my arm. I wake up and I still have brain injury. I wake up, you know, knowing I had that accident. But by living in that world of paradox, by living in the world where I both missed the car and had my accident, through stories, I can have them talk back and forth to each other. Various types of therapies rely on visualization, and the point of rewriting a traumatic event, as Kevin was encouraged to do, seems to be that it gives the brain a break from constantly replaying the nightmare over and over. And every day he did have to live with the facts of that brain injury, of facial reconstruction, of a right arm that used to be healthy, that now was completely immobile of having to do more with the disabled left arm he was born with. In all of this, though, Kevin has had a lot of help from doctors over the years, doctors who have helped him rewrite his story. I learned early about good doctors, lawyers, preachers. They're all on the journey with us. And by that, I mean their success is tied to our own. And I can always tell a good doctor because they are on the journey with me. They're like Virgil with Dante. They're not just telling you your journey. They're with you. And they're as invested as you are in this journey. They aren't just part of your story. They are the story. When Kevin says that he learned that lesson early, he means early, like at age three. Now, one thing I didn't tell you was when he was born, Kevin's left arm wasn't usable at all because it was curled up in half so that the hand on that arm was nearly tucked under his armpit. He didn't gain the use of that arm until he was three, and he had to undergo intensive treatment in the hospital to straighten out the arm and make it functional. I am a huge, huge supporter in Fan of Shriners Hospital. We didn't have money, and they operated my arm. But hospitals in the 60s weren't run like they are today. They brought me in and my parents left. I remember my mom was crying and I knew it was something to do with what I was going through. So, uh, But she said later it was one of the hardest things she's ever done in her life. And they brought me to this room with all these other kids. They put me in a baby bed. I had my own real bed at home, like a boy bed. Now they're jamming me back in a baby bed. That was humiliating, but... But it, yeah, it was a very traumatic experience at that age. They didn't want your parents to come and visit you for like weeks at a time because they thought you would miss your parents and that would make your life even harder. And they banned your parents for a couple of weeks. And then finally they come and they can only come on Sunday. A lot of Sundays they couldn't make it. So there was my grandmother, thank goodness. But there were practices back then and they were as well-meaning as they might have been. They were pretty hard on a kid. But luckily, young Kevin had a doctor who cut through his fear. And to Kevin's earlier point, he rewrote the story with three-year-old Kevin, like Virgil with a very young Dante, to use Kevin's analogy. The doctor was Dr. Tippy, And Dr. Tippy said, don't worry, Kevin, we're going to fix your arm. And I remember I cried and I cried and I cried because my arm is what made me special. The last thing I wanted was for him to fix it. And Dr. Tippy turned to me and he said, well, then how about if we just make it work a little better and it'll still be special? And I thought about it and I went, okay, uh, yeah, that's fair. And I think of Dr. Tippy because he was the first doctor that was on the journey with me. And those are always the ones I turn to, the ones that I trust. Kevin seems adamant that others should never dictate what he can or cannot do. Not even the motorcycle crash has diminished his tenacious independence. 
In fact, healing from that crash may have left him more fixed and determined. This is a mindset that made it into his playwriting and into the message he wants to share with other people struggling with disabilities. You wrote a play about Lazarus called Joyce Rejoice, is that right? Mm -hmm. I've got a little clip from it here. Uh, Two weeks ago, I died, and Jesus, after four days, came down and pulled me back from the underworld. All I know is that I died, and I came back again, and I am here, and we are going to celebrate tonight. So was that influenced by the accident? Yes and no. That was really influenced. There's a folk tale It's about a guy who goes into town once a month for supplies and he sees a mirror and he's never seen a mirror before. So he looks in the mirror and he sees what he thinks is a picture of his father. So he buys it because he's all excited about a picture of his father, brings it home, puts it under the bed, and his wife is going under the bed for some reason a week later and she sees this mirror. She doesn't know what a mirror is either. She looks in, sees a picture of a woman. Oh, Obviously, the woman her husband is seeing every month. This looks just like the kind of hussy he would fall for. So a fight breaks out and frying pans involved. And then a neighbor says, no, no, it's a looking glass. It's a mirror. And then they're in love again, and she gets a bag of ice for his head. But the truth of the story is we don't believe what we see. We see what we believe, which is really true. And I turned to Lazarus after that because Lazarus— When Jesus went to bring Lazarus back from the dead, he said, I can't bring you back from the dead until the shroud of death is removed because as long as that shroud is on you, you will believe you're dead. And if you believe you're dead, there's nothing I can do for that. And so it is that idea of we need to believe it before we can see it. And no matter what it is, we won't believe our own eyes. And I also was working with guys in prison at the time and they were telling me, the prison would give them this suit, this blue suit. And they said, everybody that leaves, leaves with the same blue suit. And they said, the first thing we tell everybody is get out of that suit because until you're out of that suit, you're still in prison. And it is, it's what do we need to do? What do we need to shuck? What do we need to shell for ourselves to grow, for ourselves to change as we want to change? When we're going through any threshold, what do we leave behind and what do we take with us? When I asked you if that was related to the accident, you said yes and no. So what? how did the accident inform that play? Well, so often in any kind of accident or disability, we are asked to believe things of ourselves that aren't necessarily true. And this is so true in the world of disability where we have to get past that, that we have to see ourselves in a way that is, in my mind, more accurate There's a story Kevin tells as part of his act, um, well, it's a fable really, about a boy with disabilities whose life course is permanently changed when the people around him change the way they see him. They look beyond his disabilities, forgetting them altogether really, so they can clearly see the boy's personality and his spirit. Now the story is called The Good Mother. And let me just say that as a mother, I know that sometimes we have to, um, well, well, lie seems like too strong of a word, but sometimes we have to get a little creative with the truth. The Good Mother from Kevin Kling, coming right up here on Constant Wonder. I'm Tenery Taylor. Kevin Kling, ladies and gentlemen. One of my favorite, favorite words is belonging, because it's two words, being somewhere and longing to be somewhere else. So it's this paradox that we all live in, where we are our most happy. We need safety and we need risk. We need a challenge and we need to know that we are in a nest. And I think that's the most beautiful thing about being humans is that we live in this paradox. This leads me to my story. Long ago, there was a boy a young boy, and 
he was different than the other boys. His head sat on one shoulder blade and his spine was crooked and one leg was shorter than the others. And at first all the other boys teased him, but then they realized, you know, we're not getting anywhere with this kid because he didn't care. He didn't care. He thought it was their problem they were teasing him. And so he just had this glowing spirit. And so finally the boys just stopped and they embraced the kid as one of their own because he just had this, this personality that just drew you in. This girl moved to town, young girl, she saw the boy and she thought, how can he be embraced? I mean, who is this kid? How can this be happening? And then she started to see this kid and how that the other kids just loved him. The little girl started to worry about the boy. She came to the boy's mother and she said, I worry about your son. I mean, he's fine now. It's a little kid, but when he gets older and it comes time to marry, who will he find? How will he find someone to love? This is a question I asked my grandmother. This is a question I asked when I was a kid. Who will I find to love? This is when the boy's mother turned to the girl and said, I don't worry about that. She said, because my boy turned to me one day and he said, mom, don't worry. I already know my wife. I already know who she is. He said, before I was born, he said, the angels were putting me together. They were putting my body together. And the angel putting my limbs on said, you know, I have never seen a spirit like yours. I've never seen someone that has this glowing spirit. He said, you are really lucky. Nothing's going to phase you in your life. You're going to be the happiest kid in the world. And he said, just as a gift, I'm going to point to see across the room. There's your wife. That's going to be your wife. And the boy looked across the room, and there was this girl with the most beautiful soul he'd ever seen, this spirit of a dancer, this beautiful free spirit. And he saw the angels putting her body together, and her head sat on one shoulder blade, and her spine was crooked, and one leg was shorter than the other. And the boy said, that, that's not fair. That's not her soul. That's not right. That's a wrong body on this soul. And the angel said, well, that's the body she's going to get. And the boy said, what if we traded? What if we traded bodies? And, and the angel said, well, I, I suppose we could do that, but why would you want to have that body instead of the one you have? He says, because of my spirit. I'm not going to care. You already told me that. I'm going to have the happiest life. You already know that, and so do I. So it doesn't really matter to me. And besides, she is the soul of a dancer. She needs to be in a body that moves. And the angel said, okay, we'll do that. That sounds fine. So they traded the bodies. And the boy's mother said, so you see, to the girls, I don't worry about him because he's going to be fine. Because he's the kind of kid that the veil of this world to the next has always been very thin. So I know he was telling me the truth. So the girl heard that and she thought, I wonder who that girl is. She's in this town somewhere. And so she watched the boy. And as time went on, they became good friends. They became really close friends. And she thought, who is that girl? Who is? And then after time went on, she went, I, I wish I was that girl. And then after time went on, she said, I have to be that girl. And then she thought, I can't risk it any longer. So she walked up to the boy and she asked if he would marry her. And he said, yes, of course. And she was so happy because at that moment she knew she was that girl. She was the one he had seen. So they got married. They had a really great, happy life. They had children. Everything didn't go smoothly because after all, this is a true story, not a fairy tale. And so they went through their lives, and in old age, they were together. And one day, the boy turned, now an old man, turned to his wife, and he said, I can't believe you asked me to marry you. I feel so happy. I feel so lucky. And she goes, don't even try that with me. I already heard the whole story. Your mother told me everything, so I know luck had nothing to do with it. And he walked up, and he hugged, and he kissed her, even though he had no idea what she was talking about. I call that story the good mother. Because <laughs> so often it's just our perceptions that need to drop. That's all we need is once our perceptions drop and we see somebody for who they are and all the window dressing is gone, we know the purity of themselves and their soul and of our own. When I sat down with Kevin, he really had an ask me anything approach to our conversation that was a relief to me as an interviewer. 
I'll admit, though, that he didn't jump in to help me the first time I stumbled around trying to describe his birth defect, but he also didn't shy away from pointed questions about his disabilities. He seemed to encourage those questions. I believe he wants us all to peel back those layers and really see each other. But he acknowledges that people don't always know how to treat him. So I had to ask him, did you have to see yourself as more able than other people saw you? Of course. All the time. All the time you have to do that. What does that look like on a daily basis? Well-meaning people say, can I help you? And I love that. Every time, if somebody wants to know, should I ask? Yes, you should ask. But usually then when I say no, what I go through looks really difficult. And it is that I have to do. But I have to do it because chances are good you're not going to be there the next time I need to do this. And by this, you mean opening a door? Putting my socks on. You wouldn't believe how many months it took me to figure out how to put on socks. Or doing just things that look, or getting ready to get on a bus with my change. And so oftentimes you'll see somebody with a disability, and it looks like they have some kind of OCD or strange ritual or anything. No, they're doing something, so they're ready for what they know is coming up. And so it looks like I've got some kind of change issue, but I know if I don't have that change exactly ready when that bus comes, I'll just, I'll have to miss it because I won't be able to get on it. Kevin never dismisses the fear he faces and and that we all face in both the daily grind and in the midst of disasters. And surprisingly, he ties up that fear with the word awe, which if you listen to our show often, you know that's a phenomenon we're committed to exploring. The word awe, I looked up several years ago. I wanted to know what it meant because everyone's saying awesome all the time, awesome. And I looked it up and it's, a combination of fear and wonder. And I think when we think of all, we think of the wonder side, but we forget the fear side. And I think the fear side is associated with the unknown, is that there needs to be a sense of the unknown when you experience something that brings awe. And because of that, of course, fear is attached to it. And I think that that's essential in the word awe and essential in the feeling of it. That paradox of fear and wonder is such a human, beautiful paradox. We've had a peek into Kevin Kling's evolution as a storyteller, giving up a story about taxidermy because he himself became more sensitive to the pain of other creatures, his motorcycle accident and decision not to die which is what he claims it was. His decision to stay because he had something to do here on Earth. That transformation of his perspective, it's all tied up in a story I asked him to tell me. So this story is called The Three Phases of Prayer. And the first phase is when you're a kid and you're praying to get things. And I'm thinking of this especially as my family would always drive from uh, Minnesota to Missouri to spend Christmas with my grandparents. And we get in the Impala station wagon, my brother and I looking out of the back window and my sister in the middle, mom and dad up front. We'd be going through Iowa and my mom's singing, what did I away, boys? What did I away? And we'd sing, she way to Washington, mom, she way to Washington. Mom had a song for every state in the union. Her song for Wisconsin goes, uh, I love to live in Wisconsin and smell the dairy air. So we're going through Wisconsin and I take a moment to pray to God, to ask Jesus, to tell Santa to bring me a squirrel monkey for Christmas. I thought, I'll go down the, the hierarchy of power and get that squirrel monkey. And But I never did. I never got a squirrel monkey just as much as I prayed. And so that was the first phase of prayer, though, getting something. Well, then my prayers changed when I was in college, and they changed to get me out of this. One example is I was— uh, on this island called Eos in the Mediterranean. And I wanted to get back to Athens. This was between my junior and senior year of college. And I'm on Eos, and I reach in my pocket. Oh, man, I only have $20 left. And I still want to see Italy and Ireland. So I decide to stow away on this boat. And I did. I stowed away. I, they never even looked for tickets. And I'm sitting next to this guy from France, and I go, Hey, man, they didn't even look for tickets. I bought this boat for free. And he goes, Well, they haven't even come around yet. They're going to come around a little bit. And he says, when they find you, he said, this happened to friends of mine. 
they're going to take you below and beat you with socks full of bars of soap because for some reason that doesn't show bruises. I'm like, no, they won't. I'm an American. Oh, he says, they're going to love you. And so sure enough, these guys come up looking for tickets and I hide behind these barrel looking depth charge things, but they saw my shoes. So they blow this whistle and now it's cat and mouse on top of the deck. And I saw this rope ladder hanging over the side of the deck and I climbed down the ladder and I'm looking for land. I just said, if I see land, land anywhere, I'm just dropping in and swimming for it. And I, and I start to pray. I had not prayed in years, and I started to pray, please, God, get me out of this. Get me out of this, and I promise I'll never do anything this stupid again as long as I live. And I'm Russian, wild Russian boar hunting in Texas. They brought wild Russian boar. These things weigh like 500, 600 pounds, and you hunt them in the middle of the night because they eat meat at night, which is you. So we're hunting these boars in the middle of the night, and I'm what's called the light man. I've got a flashlight, and my job is to shine the light on the boar and then the guide, Mario, will shoot it. Well, I go, Mario, aren't they going to come with the, for the guy with the light? He goes, yeah. So I decide right then and there, if I see a wild Russian boar, I'm going to shine the light on Mario. Ooh, there's a big one. Well, Mario finally, he just lays down and falls asleep on his rifle. And I'm out there in the middle of Texas waiting for a wild Russian boar to come and eat me. And I start to pray. I pray, please, God, please get me out of this. Get me out of this. And I promise I'll never do anything this stupid again as long as I live. And I'm at Mardi Gras. Okay, we know where that one's going. So my prayer shifted for the third and final time when I was in the hospital after my accident. And I'm in the hospital, and 9-11 happens in the United States. And I watch as our country goes through the same symptoms of post-traumatic stress that I'm going through. We all go through from anger to vengeance to denial. And every day, I would take the elevator down to the bottom floor and try to walk a half a block. That's all the further I could make it. And one day I get in the elevator and there's this kid, probably eight years old, and he turns to me and he says, I hit my head on a fence post and I had to get eight stitches here. He points to the back of his head. I go, oh yeah? I said, I had to get stitches here to here. I go around my head, down one arm and down one leg to the floor. The kid looks at me and says, yeah, but mine really hurt. He's got me. You can never judge another man's pain. So I get to the bottom floor. I take my half block walk and I come back and my wife, Mary, is standing there and she's got an apple. She goes, you got to try these. These are the best apples. I, Mary, I know I, th- it just doesn't sound good. See, I don't know if you've ever been intubated or not, but you just lose flavor. Food has no flavor. And I'd lost all interest. I was losing a lot of weight and Mary was worried. So she says, please just try it for me. Okay. So I take a bite, and that was the day flavor returned. And I felt this sweetness hit my tongue. And when the sweetness hit my tongue, I started to cry. I had not cried in years. And as the tears flushed out all the antibiotics and toxins, my eyes started to burn. But between the burning in my eyes and the sweetness in my mouth, it felt so good to be alive. I said, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And that's the day my prayers shifted to prayers of thanks. And I don't know whether good things started to happen to me because I was noticing them or, or because I was saying thank you, but it doesn't matter. Every day I see blessings in my curses. Every day somebody helps me, and I'm here to say nobody looks better than when they're helping somebody. So I'll be at home with Mary, and we're sitting there. Our wiener dogs are there. Wiener dogs really help me a lot because you'll never see a more can-do attitude and a more can't-do body than a wiener dog. And, uh, and oh, and our basset hound, we had our basset hound. Uh, when the breeder dropped him off, he was 10 weeks old, and she goes, now, when it comes to training basset hounds, they start out slow, but then they taper off. So we got him, we're looking in the fire, and uh, I'm at such peace that I take a moment to pray to God, to ask Jesus to tell Santa, if there's one thing I want, it's to say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Or a squirrel monkey. Thank you for sharing that. I'd like to ask you a different question about prayer, because that's how your prayers changed. Mm-hmm. But people were praying for you yeah. when you were in the hospital. Were you aware of that? Absolutely. I always liken it to, I felt like at times I was behind a power boat when I just had to hang on. Prayers, well wishes, however you want to define it. And they actually, there has been research done that when people have been given 
prayers, well wishes, that it is markably changed that their recovery is, is a lot stronger. It really does. It really puts something, eh, yeah, this is an intangible, but what do you say when something works? Here's another intangible. We started this hour with a story about taxidermy and how the wonder children experience can sometimes get derailed into mischief and maybe even a little bit of mayhem. I think as kids, the balance between wonder and reality it hasn't been formed yet, so it's mostly wonder. And so part of it is we go into the reality, and the problem is reality ends up taking over everything as we get older. But then Kevin says something happens in our twilight years, and the trajectory of wonder that hits its nadir maybe in middle age, it begins to reverse course. I liken it to where the sun rises and the sun sets. There's the same kind of light at two different ends of the day. And so that idea of wonder coming back to us at a certain point, which means that it has never left us. It's just now in the way as a kid you have to tap into reality. As an adult, you have to tap into wonder. And we have to open those channels. So one of my favorite places, one of the places I was always really, really happy was my grandparents' farm. We had what was called unstructured time, which now they call boredom. <laughs> but I was never bored on that farm, and I've not been bored to this day. I've been to places where I wished I was somewhere else, and I've been to plays where I would have fallen asleep if I hadn't been the one talking. <laughs> but I still have never been bored, and I've got my grandparents to thank. My grandpa was one of those German farmers as wide as he was tall. We used to say if it wasn't for the direction of his buttons, we wouldn't have known if he was laying down or standing up. <laughs> and the story that sums him up best, I think, is a story of a Minnesota farmer. He had 162 acres, which isn't very much land at all. And he was so proud of his land. He was so proud of his farm. And one day, a guy from Texas was visiting. And this Texan said, the Minnesotan was bragging about his farm. And the Texan said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. He said, my ranch in Texas, I get in my truck in the morning and I start driving. And by nightfall, I haven't hit the end of my ranch. And the Minnesotan said, yeah, I used to have a truck like that. So that's my grandpa. My grandma, she's one of those German farmer, the women, she's just amazing. She's, uh, there's always a little fear around her though. Like there was this rooster on that farm and that rooster would peck me. And I'd say, grandma, the rooster's pecking me. And she'd say, just stay away from it. And I'd, I'd say, grandma. And then one day it pecked my sister and that night we ate chicken. <laughs> Toughest chicken I ever ate. But from that rooster I learned, be careful who you peck. This is a story I want to tell about my grandpa. My grandpa could fix anything. That was the thing about him. He would even, he would come to our house and spend two weeks every summer in our house fixing everything in our house. He'd fix the stove. He'd plane the doors. He would do everything in the house. And in two weeks, he would transform our house. You know, the toilet would be completely disassembled. And my mom's like, I've got company coming in an hour. It was back together again, no problem. He was just so amazing at fixing every single thing in the house. And I remember my grandpa was there one day during his two-week stay, and they were painting the house. And my brother and I were playing, and we were always in the way. We were so, and my, they said, get out of here, you kids, go into the backyard. So we went into the backyard, and my brother and I were playing with a ball, and we were kicking it back and forth to each other. And I took the ball, and I kicked it further than I ever kicked it, and it went over the house, and we heard this, ah! <laughs> we went around the house, and there was the ball in the bucket of paint, and my grandpa covered in paint. It had gone in the paint. And they said, how did this happen? I don't know, I don't know. I said, I don't know, someone kicked the ball over. And I was like, oh man. And my dad was laughing so hard we didn't get punished for a while. But <laughs> when he came to his senses, he said, you kids are grounded, you're grounded. And so we had to spend that night in our own backyard. And the problem was, it was the 4th of July. Best night to go out for fireworks. And we couldn't, we had to sit in the backyard with my grandpa. Well, I could tell 
still harbored a bit of a grudge from that ball. And so we're sitting next to my grandpa. And I have to say, Minnesotans, we're kind of known for our silences. We don't talk very much. And my grandpa could sit for hours and never say a word, but it had no bearing on how he felt about you. We know in Minnesota that silences aren't measured by length. They're measured by depth. And my grandpa, I could tell that when he lost his brother, that he loved his brother very much because his silence was deep, and we can only grieve as deeply as we love. So my grandpa and I were sitting there next to each other, and you could barely see the fireworks over the tops of these trees. I'm like, this is the worst 4th of July ever. My grandpa is going, ooh, ah, there's a pretty one. Oh, what, grandpa, what are you talking about? He goes, oh, there's a rose and a tulip and, and a daisy. What? And he goes, oh, he says there's lilies and lilacs and lavender. My grandpa thought the fireworks were flowers. And so I I thought, hey, remember my imagination? I thought, I'm going to let it go on purpose this time and follow my grandpa through his fireworks garden. And so I did. And no sooner had I done that, there's marigolds, there's orchids, there's snapdragons, there's sunflowers. All of a sudden, the worst 4th of July became the best 4th of July. And then the fireworks stopped and the stars came out. And my grandpa and I are standing there and and we're looking up at the stars and he says, Kevin, you know, those are the ancestors. And they're looking down. They have seen everything, everything that's come before, everything that's come after. They're like a land of forgotten things waiting to be retrieved. And I said, Grandpa, there's the Big Dipper. I learned about it in school. And he goes, Yeah, he said, very good, Kevin. I go, and that's uh, uh, Orion. You can tell by the three stars that make up his belt. He says, that's really good, Kevin. He says, do you know what that one is? I said, no, Grant, I don't think that is a constellation, Grandpa. He said, it is now. I call it the wiener dog. And I look, I go, well, that does look like a wiener dog. And then (laughs) I go, okay, Grandpa, what's that one there? He goes, I don't know. And I go, that's our neighbor, the guy with the nose. He goes, that is a guy with the nose. And then... He says, what's this? And it looked like two circles. And I go, I don't, oh, I do know. Pepperoni pizza, large and small, major and minor. He said, very good, Kevin. And, uh, and then, oh, and then I said, Grandpa, do you know what that one is? He goes, it looks like a squirrel. I say, it is, it is, it's a squirrel. I'm <laughs> really good. And I go, and what's next to the squirrel? He goes, is that a shark? Yes, shark and squirrel, unlikely best friends, a new constellation by Kevin Kling. And he says, <laughs> and he says very good. But we watch the stars all night. And then all of a sudden he says, Kevin, there's the wishing star. Make a wish. And I said, all right, I wish, I wish. He said, what'd you wish for? And I said, I wish... I wish that ball didn't land in that paint, Grandpa. It was me that kicked it over. I'm really sorry. And he said, that's okay, Kevin. He said, it was pretty funny. And I said, it, actually, it was really funny. And he said, okay, that's enough. <laughs> and my grandpa and I sat out there, and we watched the stars all through the night. And then one, all of a sudden, he says, you know, Kevin, one day I'm going to be up in those stars looking down at you. And I said, I know, Grandpa but that's not tonight. And he said, no, that's not tonight. We stood out there under the stars the rest of the night, and that is when I knew my grandpa could fix anything. You'll hear that story and many more when you subscribe to the Appleseed Podcast. I'm Tenery Taylor here on the Constant Wonder Podcast. It was my great pleasure to sit down with professional storyteller Kevin Kling ahead of his live taping of that story we just heard and several others, which will air on the Appleseed Podcast in upcoming weeks and months. This episode was produced by me, Tenery Taylor, with help from Audrey Hughes, Addie Mangum, Kira Brewer, Kevin West, and Sam Clausen. Constant Wonder is a production of BYU Radio.